Thank you, Derek. And um, can you just excuse me for taking my jacket off? I was a I see you've increased your stocking density since, uh, since last year and um, I was getting a little bit warm, so uh, please excuse me for taking that off. Um, once again, it's fantastic to be back here at New South Wales Farmers Conference. Uh, this is my third conference and, um, and uh, obviously it's been a fantastic relationship between the New South Wales Government and New South Wales Farmers in the time that I've been uh, Minister for Primary Industries. It is difficult to follow someone like Nick, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about Nick uh, a bit, little bit later on, but also off the back of some of the words that Barnaby spoke about earlier. Hopefully you'll see uh, what Barnaby was talking about in a broader sense, um, as far as our nation goes, um, amplified down to what we are doing in New South Wales to meet some of those challenges as a government, but also in partnership with industry and also organisations like New South Wales Farmers. So that's what I'm just going to spend a little bit of time about speaking um, about today. But firstly, we need to make sure that before we turn directly to what we're doing in the primary industry sector, we need to make sure that we have a state government that is performing well and a budget that's able to deliver the things that uh, the industry is crying out for. And that's exactly what we're able to do with the budget that we handed down uh, a few weeks ago here in New South Wales. It's a budget that's taken a lot of hard work to get to the point that we're in uh, here in New South Wales. Um, in 2011, when we came into government, the state wasn't performing um, anywhere uh, like it is now. We were, in some cases, running last in some of the, the performance indicators. But as we stand here today, we've just delivered a budget with a $4.5 billion um, surplus. We have the lowest unemployment rate of the nation. We have also the, the best growth in the nation, but the story is even better when you look at regional New South Wales. And the story of how the economy is performing in regional New South Wales is one that is um, absolutely outclassing every other region within Australia. Since 2011, um, we've been able to uh, create uh, 58,000 jobs in regional New South Wales, and uh, we're also seeing uh, a lot of that coming off the back the way that primary industries has been performing. We've not only been doing the things that governments are supposed to do, investing in infrastructure and, and providing those opportunities, but we're now at a point where I think that what you see in the New South Wales government and our agencies, particularly the Department of Primary Industries, are agencies that aren't performing traditionally like governments have performed in the past. An agency that is better attuned to what industry needs, but more importantly is adding value uh, on the farm and also post the farm gate. And that's what I want to have a little bit of time to talk about um, while I'm with you here this morning or this afternoon. In New South Wales, the Department of Prime Ministries in 2015 took a bold move and set a, a target to grow the sector um, by 30% by 2020. And that sometimes is a, a difficult task for, for when governments and government agencies go ahead and put the targets that they want to achieve actually into numbers because sometimes you're just setting yourself up to be measured and sometimes measured for failure. But we knew though that in order to be able to do that, we also as a government needed to be able to provide the right environment for the sector to be able to reach that target. And as we stand here today, um, just two years on from setting that target, we're very close to hitting that 30% increase of the sector here in New South Wales. And that increase has been happening right across the sector, predominantly in, in the traditional areas, and we look at the, the results of wheat and beef that are each contributing now over $2.5 billion uh, for those industries to, to the New South Wales prime industry sector. Cotton, horticulture and wool, each around the billion dollar mark. Poultry, sheep and goat meat, more than $800 million each. They are obviously the big drivers that are, are leading that growth here in New South Wales. But that growth, yes, it's based upon seasonal conditions. Yes, it's based on market access and opportunity into other jurisdictions. But it's also based upon some of the work and the investment that's been made by the New South Wales government. Investment, not just in dollar terms, but also the human capital that we have within our agencies to be able to put the best minds in the country and, and in the world to try and address some of those problems of feeding that increasing population around the world that Barnaby spoke about earlier. But in order to be able to know where we invest 
in order to know um, what areas may be struggling, in order to know which regions of the state are responsible for some of that growth, our economists in DPI have taken it upon themselves to get as much information as possible that's available out there in, in the different sectors and the public sphere and start to do some of their own analytics. Start to produce this information so that you can have that up-to-date information. Some of it is forecasted, but some of it is also, for the first time, now starting to look at the numbers in real time. Not waiting for ABARES to make a report one or two seasons after uh, the event or the cycle that you're farming with, but to be able to analyse that. At the Farm Writers um, uh, speech that I gave a few weeks ago, we produced this red book that DPI have been able to take that information through our economists and consolidate it in, into this. Can I encourage you to get your hands on that? Encourage you to have a look at some of the projections that our economists have made, because that's also leading us in the decisions that we are making as a government. Because as a government, we've got, a, I think, a very defining role as we go forward to look at the sectors that are going to not only give us the best bang for our buck, but also protect those that are so valuable to the New South Wales economy. The other thing is that we're also looking at new opportunities. And that's the good news apart about this uh, growth in the, in the sector as we head towards that 30%. One of the most satisfying things uh, for me as Minister is to be able to take a piece of legislation through Parliament and then to be able to stand out in a paddock and see what we dreamt through our agencies like DPI, what we took to the Parliament, what we said in Macquarie Street is now popping out of the ground in, in different parts of New South Wales for the first time in history. Sorry, second time in history. I need to be reminded sometimes when I say that. I'm talking about poppies. Another opportunity for our growers here in New South Wales. We changed the legislation. We based it off the back of our scientific expertise and advice from the department. And I was able to stand out in, in near Cowra just recently and see poppies popping out of the ground for the first time in this state. Sorry, second time. The reason I keep getting reminded is that we did do this as a department back in the 1940s. And I received a fantastic letter from an ex-DPI um, staff member in their 90s the other day to correct me that I keep saying for the first time in this state, but he actually was responsible for growing it at Yanko uh, back in the 1940s. We've also then looked at other avenues like hemp as food, and we'll be changing the regulation in the next uh, session of parliament to allow again our farmers to be able to access hemp as food as another option. We've got a facility being built to start the first cultivation of medicinal cannabis uh, through one of our facilities here in New South Wales. And we've also got uh, some of those superfoods and some of the agronomics that we're doing down in places like Leeton when we look at quinoa and, and some of those other new, uh, new options that are available to our farmers. It's New South Wales government through DPI and, and LLS, we're doing the trials. We're getting the agro agronomics right. We're looking at the genetics so that we then can present it to, to you to be able to get on and do what you do best. But another fantastic story that's contributing to this is aquaculture. And that's why it's really exciting to see Nick as our Farmer of the, the Year here in, in New South Wales. I'd encourage every one of you to go up and have a look at his operation at Port Stephens. It's fantastic to look at not only is he producing that protein and getting good returns on the protein in versus uh, protein out or the, the feed in versus protein out ratios, but then he's addressing the issue of what to do with the water, value adding with the, the hydroponics and the horticulture but then he's delivering it directly into his restaurant and, and adding more um, to his story. Uh, he's a fantastic speaker. Um, if you are going up there, give yourself plenty of time, um, particularly if, uh, if he's there, and uh, you'll be well looked after, but he, he loves a chat. So it's fantastic to see those types of new industries in New South Wales that are really gaining legs. $65 million is what, uh, what Aquaculture is worth to the New South Wales economy at the moment as well. These are all increasing to the story and to the picture of what we have uh, for New South Wales. But we're not going to just rest on our laurels and say, yep, we're nearly hit our 30% target. We want to continue to drive and, and move into new areas. And this is where I think the story of what, we're happen what has been happening here in New South Wales is very different to what you've seen in the past. We know that investment in research and development um, shouldn't just be about research for research's sake. 
It needs to be research that's relevant, but also it needs to be taken up by the industry. It needs to be able to be implemented on farm. It needs to be distributed quickly. And the best way to do that is to be able to um, work with industry to become partners in this story. The other thing that frustrates me is I want our people that are involved in research to be researchers, not grant funding application experts. <laughs> they need to spend time out in the paddocks. They don't need to spend time in front of their computers typing up an application to worry about whether they can continue their project or not. Funding for R&D shouldn't, shouldn't be a sugar hit for political cycles. It needs to be thinking about what the industry needs. And this is one of the major differences that you've seen from the New South Wales government with their, um, their a joint announcement with GRDC for a 10-year, $130 million funding envelope to make sure that our, uh, when I go to AgQuip, one of the best things I love is not only the egg and bacon roll at the New South Wales Farmers Tent, but listening to the joint presentation by our agronomists and GRDC about some of the new chick chickpea uh, varieties that they've been working on that's actually adding value to what you do. And the reason they can get on and do that now is because we've unlocked them from their desks. We've allowed them to continue in the paddocks for, for the next uh, 10 years because they don't have to keep going back to, to write funding applications. And that's a credit to a department that's thinking outside the box, but more importantly, an industry partner that's willing to lock in an investment like that, not just for, a, again, a political cycle, but for a decade to make sure that we've got certainty for the sector. But it doesn't, start, it doesn't stop with grains. It's also some of the partnerships with MLA and, and the University of New England when we're looking at some of the, the meat genetics. It's also looking at uh, how we work with industry to be able to um, do research, not for research sake, but what the grower or the producer needs and then make sure it gets implemented on farm. But we're also looking at how we do this with technology as well. We've got a partnership here in New South Wales with Cisco they wanted to set their internet of things, the base for the world, for agriculture, right here in New South Wales. And we're now trialling new technology at some of our research stations to make sure that we iron out all the bugs, make sure that we work out what is uh, going to, to be affordable but also practical to be implemented on farm, so that we then can turn around and make sure that you as the farmer can be able to, to implement that and hopefully increase your sustainability but also your um, profitability. So we're looking at new areas, but we're not looking at it by ourselves. We're looking at it with industry partners, with research institutions to make sure that we make a real difference when it comes to some of the numbers not only we see as a government, but more importantly what you see as a producer. So while we're looking at those new things though, we're still also getting on and doing some of the uh, hard lifting and implementation of the things that we've been working on as a government. Obviously, I stood at the conference last year and we talked a lot about our biodiversity reforms. I stand here today. We've taken the legislation through the parliament. We're gearing up with LLS, boots on the ground, more boots than you've ever seen before to be able to implement this. More funding that's ever been allocated to an area like this. Working towards a, a, an August 25 switch on and a system that is a much better system than what the, uh, the alternative in New South Wales is offering up. A system that the Labor Party has already guaranteed through the debate in the parliament and the leaders address and reply to the budget speech a few weeks ago that one of the first things on their minds if they uh, take office in 2019 is to rip up the work that's been done to try and uh, overturn some of the injustices when it comes to native vegetation in this state to ignore some of the input that the farming organisations have had uh, into that policy and to be able to go back to 1996 and pitch farmer against environmentalists and, uh, and against the, the broader community. Where we stand today and what we're looking towards to August 25 is a system that uh, provides greater benefits and flexibility for our farmers, will lead to better environmental outcomes and, uh, and I'll challenge anyone that thinks that what we are going towards is a worse system than what we've had in the past. If we just take the example of offsets that I know that have been discussed at conference over uh, particularly yesterday and, and also in the media, under the old system, an offset may have been at a ratio of around 1 to 10, sometimes up to 1 to 30, where it's locked up 
and the only return it would give to that farmer is compound interest on weeds and pests. Under our new system, the average will be one to two to four. The offset will be able to be managed with some of the management codes. Management means you may be able to get a productive use of those offsets. You may be able to graze in some of those offsets. You'll be able to control weeds and pests. And that is the type of system that we're bringing in here in New South Wales. But the key is to the implementation. Just like the key to the implementation of the new biosecurity legislation that we have here in New South Wales. And in order to get the implementation right, we need to have an agency that's geared up, that's invited on farm, that knows the system and is there to work for the farmer to be able to produce the right outcomes. And that, and that agency is LLS when we in, in this case. I'm confident that LLS is up to the task. A new chair with uh, Richard Bull, a new leader of the executive uh, unit with David Witherden and, and uh, new members of the executive, new appointed government board members, newly elected um, board members, but more importantly, new funding that's come out of the, the New South Wales budget and more support than ever before had to have boots on the ground to be able to implement this. Equip people quite often say, well, what's their role going to be? Their role is to work out what you need to do and to be able to help you deliver it. You don't need to know every technical specica specification about the, uh, the legislation or the codes. I use the analogy, when I go in to buy a car, I don't talk, I don't need to know what's in every piece of the specification out of the manual. I don't need to talk to the person that designed the engine. I don't need to talk about uh, every measurement of the vehicle. I need to go in and speak to a person that knows where that information is or how to best present it to me. I tell them what I'm looking for and they provide me with options to be able to suit my needs. That works if you trust the fellow you're asking the information You're dead right. Yeah, absolutely dead right. The, 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 uh, the comment from the floor was that works if you trust the person that's, uh, that, that you're asking the information. Whether I trust car salesmen or, or not is probably... Um, um, <laughs> but I'm a politician, what am I going to say, right? Um, <laughs> but um, absolutely it involves that trust. Absolutely it involves someone to know who you are, what your needs are, what your business is. And that's why we have LLS. That's why we don't... That's why we have 11 regions. That's why we don't have one centralised bureaucracy coming out of Macquarie Street or based in Martin Place. That's why we have people that you know that are responding to the ads that you're seeing in the land, in your local communities, putting their hand up to get that information so they can come out and speak to you about biodiversity, about pest and weed management. They're the people you turn to in an emergency response. They're the people you'll be asking questions about biosecurity. They're the same ones that you talk to about natural resource management. And there's also a component of agricultural extension that they provide. We've backed this reform, we've backed LLS with funding, we've backed it with boots on the ground, and this will take some time. There's an absolute breakdown in this area between the sector and what the previous Labor government did, which means there's a deficit of trust. This is a hard starting point for agencies like LLS to come from. It's a hard sell for me to stand up in here and say, I'm from the government, trust me. But I'm offering you the best opportunity you have in this space than you've had in the last 20 years. I'm offering you a system that will start on the 25th of August. I'm offering you record amounts of funding that you'll never ever see in this space, particularly if we lose government in 2019. And more importantly, you'll get a chance to challenge that at the panel that we'll have here a little bit later on when we'll have the shadow treasurer from Wollongong to come here and talk to you about farming. That's what I'm offering you um, through the New South Wales government and what we present um, as an opportunity. But what we're also doing is getting on with those other areas like the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Again, it took a lot of work to get to where we did a few weeks ago to make sure that we did not default and go to the default setting of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. We worked hard to make sure that we got the 650 downwater through um, infrastructure and trying to, since on my watch, no more productive water being bought out of New South Wales. And we'll continue to advocate for New South Wales in this space. We'll continue to make sure that we set up the sector for any sort of challenge that's presented to it as we go forward. And we'll continue to do that because we have a relationship to be able to work with New South Wales farmers and a willingness to do so. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, I'll, I'll sum up just briefly by saying we're not done yet. I'm not working to uh, political cycles. Our commitments around R&D funding, our commitments to working on plans that I won't see the fruits of in my generation are because we're committed to the industry. We're committed to put skin in the game, just like you have. We're committed to making sure that when we make decisions and leading up to those decisions, New South Wales Farmers has a seat at the table when we're making those decisions. We don't always get it right, but we try bloody hard to make sure that we do. But more importantly, even if we make decisions that you disagree with, one thing that we never want to be criticised for is not understanding what the issue is, but more importantly, if we give you a decision that you don't agree with, explaining why that is. And that's the commitment that I give to you going forward. We're going to keep on doing more of the same. Um, my role changed earlier this year. I now can look even further beyond the, the farm gate. I've now added trade to, to my portfolio, which absolutely makes sense that we go from not just paddock to plate, we, know we now go from paddock to port or paddock to plain. That gives me an amazing opportunity to continue to advocate on behalf of our producers here in New South Wales. We're also leading by example in DPI just recently uh, engaging a, uh, a New South Wales DPI agribusiness development manager based in Shanghai. Every time I get to, to now uh, meet our international partners and, and our other markets you're trying to get into, I get the opportunity to be able to start the conversation with the same thing that touches every person in this country than every other person around the world. We need our food producers three times a day. As Barnaby alluded to earlier, we need our underwear to be made uh, out of, out of uh, other fibres and our suits. And that's, and that's the thing that we get to put front and centre because I now have added trade to the, uh, to the equation. But I've also now got a seat on the Expenditure Review Committee and I've also got a seat now in the leadership. And just like Barnaby has at a federal level, it now means that in New South Wales and also in the, the federal government, agriculture has a seat at the leadership table, has a seat at the table every time a dollar uh, goes through those expenditure review committees and has a seat um, at the two, uh, two most important contributors uh, to, to the sector coming out of New South Wales, both in our government and also the federal government. So ladies and gentlemen, that's what we're going to continue doing. We're going to continue to advocate for farmers. We're going to continue to listen to what you have to say. And uh, hopefully, uh, we've got another budget to go in 2018. We'll be able to continue on addressing some of the areas that, uh, that I know that you're passionate about. Lastly, well, this is probably something that doesn't happen a lot. I'm going to take this opportunity as a representative of the New South Wales government to say thank you. Thank you for what you do. The only reason the people that are outside this building can do what they're doing today is because they don't need to worry about where they're going to get their lunch or their dinner tonight. Because you've done that for them. We remind everyone when we have every opportunity about that. We can remind them on a daily basis. We can remind them three times a day that without you, they can't do what they're doing out there. So on behalf of the government, hopefully uh, we are a, a uh, well, I am a strong conduit and a strong voice for what you do. Thanks for what you're doing. We'll keep doing what we're doing. We continue to work together. The relationship with uh, Derek and the team has been fantastic. We're not done yet. We've got, uh, we've got more work to do and we're getting stuck into it. Thank you. Um, yeah, you some, I, Thank you. The Minister has uh, agreed to take some quick questions and then we'll have to get on to scholarship recipients. So maybe while we are getting to scholarship recipients in, we can have a quick question. Mitchell. Thanks, thanks Mr Chairman and uh, Minister Blair, look, thank, thanks very much for your, your address and uh, I appreciate our previous conversation but I think for the benefit of conference I've got to ask you with relation to biodiversity reform. <clears throat> um, you, you mentioned as Barnaby did the need for increase in production and uh, I, know, I know you hear the frustrations of I do of some of our farmers uh, <clears throat> who have the capacity and the know-how and the will and want to increase, you know, increase their production but in an environmentally friendly way but are absolutely frustrated. Um, and 
and we as uh, the panel are working with you and your department, frustrated in, in some of uh, our deliberations in trying to mould the legislation that will enable farmers to go ahead in, as a, and I impress in an environmentally friendly way. You mentioned offsets. What really took my breath away uh, was when I heard what uh, was rolled out by OEH in the uh, workshop in, in uh, Cooma with, re with regard to grasslands. The single biggest active that I can manipulate and cultivate as a grazier is my pasture. Um, <clears throat> and we've long, as a working group, advocated that the uh, OEH using soil disturbance as a proxy for, for improved pasture um, is flawed. And that's come out pretty, pretty uh, evidently in that workshop where producers down there saw it, it looks like about 80% of the grassland of Monero will be regulated on a, on a grossly flawed regulatory map. So clearly this is not going to work. So, and the other thing that totally threw us is they appear to be insinuating that uh, annuals in a vegetation assessment won't count in looking at a high conservation value native pasture. Now that's clearly in contrast to what was in the uh, independent panel's report and the recommendations and the understanding we've had with you and your department that uh, past, you know, once pastures has uh, had, um, you know, been improved, had fertiliser, medics, etc., then it should not be regulated. So we've got some clear problems here that as we go forward, um, I impress again, we do appreciate the work that your department have done with us and you have done with us, but when we look at uh, what OEH, of, uh, the way they've... Uh, engage with us. It really looks as if the tail's wagging the dog here to some degree. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks, Mitchell. Um, tail wagging the dog. I, I'm sure there'll be different people that have different interpretations on who's uh, wagging whose tail uh, or, or the tail wagging who's the tail and who's the dog. But um, the, the two biggest issues that seem to be still there that we knew when we were going through this are what happens on the Monero with grasslands and also what's happening in the northwest of the state. Right? They're, they're two big issues. One of the reasons why we committed to, to pilots, particularly in the northwest of the state, and also having a closer look at what happens on the Monero. This is something that has been raised directly uh, again in my office. Uh, we've got LLS have a meeting that's already been scheduled down there with a number of key, key uh, landowners um, and people to discuss this issue. Um, we'll continue to work through that issue and I've made the commitment that maps won't go out anywhere until we're satisfied with them. That's the whole reason why we actually didn't allow the implementation of this policy to be stalled based on whether we can agree or not on what a map looks like. That's why we have a policy that on August 25, We'll turn the key and it can start. But more importantly, you don't need to wait till then. Go out and speak to LLS now and start talking to them about what you want to do in your place. Contact the hotline, book in an appointment. Start talking to them so that on August 25, we turn the key and we get going. Because we knew that the maps were going to be an issue and that's why we've said we, we don't need them to, to start what we want to do. So yes, the Monero is an issue. Um, it's something that's been engaged directly with my office. We've got key people going down there to, to meet with, um, again, key landholders down there to try and address the issues that you've raised. 